Спасибо большое участникам этого обсуждения. Мы сейчас переходим к следующему. И переходим к следующему заседанию. Let us proceed along with our agenda that is related to gastroesophageal junction. Professor Yaroslav Regula, please join the faculty. Marco Bruno. And Kirill Vecheslavovich. Okay, let us move on. Okay, Professor Yaroslav Regula is from... He is very attractive topic. What is real abnormal gastroesophageal junction and when to biopsy? Yaroslav, floor is yours. Okay, t first I would like to thank Dimitri for invitation to this uh, beautiful Moscow city and the beautiful uh, Russia Today Center. Um, I would like to have my slides, please. Uh, yes, I, have, I was giving a very detailed uh, topic. Um, uh, what is abnormal gay and when to biopsy? So, uh, if I can have this, okay. Um, so, uh, my lecture points are that I will strictly uh, stick to the topic um, and I will give you the definition of gay and also the other uh, abbreviation SCJ. What are the problems with precise description of the topic? When to take biopsies from the gay area? When taking biopsies is not recommended and what is the risk of cancer in people with irregular uh, STJ? So these shortenings are here. Um, Sorry, um, the J is gastroesophageal junction. This is the border between the esophagus and stomach, uh, and uh, it has an abbreviation like that. The other important um, uh, term is squamocolumnar junction. This is, this is slightly different term and we should exactly understand what is what. The other um, terms that we should make us remember is columnar metaplasia. It means the presence of columnar epithelium in the esophagus in this area. And also the term specialized intestinal metaplasia, uh, abbreviation SIM. This is the, uh, the presence of intestinal metaplasia within the columnar epithelium in the esophagus. So these terms, I hope, are well known, and uh, I will define them further. So gastroesophageal junction. This is the poorly defined area. In fact, nobody exactly knows where is this. Um, probably uh, for the... For the um, for the purpose of the, this talk and also for other uh, topics, this is somewhere one centimeter above the gastric folds, which are visible during endoscopy, and one centimeter below the upper border of gastric folds. So uh, this is the gastroesophageal junction. And um, this is, in fact, the border between the organ esophagus and the organ stomach. This area is special for many reasons, but also because it is exposed to injurious agents, especially reflux uh, from the stomach, and also uh, is also exposed to infection of Helicobacter pylori that is usually present, of course, in the, in the stomach. As a consequence, in this area, there are frequently uh, present inflammation and also, as a result of this long-standing inflammation, intestinal metaplasia can develop. Um, 
And uh, in real medical practice, we have the following problems there uh, with this small area. Uh, endoscopic landmarks are poorly visible, only in patients who, who, who stay uh, uh, and motility is not uh, working. We can uh, easily, and in normal situation, we can easily find landmarks, that is the upper limits of gastric faults. And we have to admit that in different studies uh, for many years, the terminology is inconsistent and different studies, especially those where the biopsies were taken, the, 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 um, uh, the authors usually say they, that they were taken from the cardia or from uh, gay region, and we never know where exactly these biopsies were taken. And also histopathologists have problems uh, with defining the area and the descri description of the findings uh, because uh, most often there is a mixture of tissues and the histopathologists have problems with detailed description of the area. So uh, let me start with saying what, is, uh, what we observe in healthy people. In healthy people, um, gay is the same as, uh, uh, so gastroesophageal junction is in the same level as the squamous columnar junction. And usually in healthy people is called Z-line. So this is the place where two organs meet and also two uh, epitheliums, squamous esophageal epithelium and gastric mucinous columnar epithelium means. So in normal people, this is easy and we should uh, be able to, to, to see. Cardia is something below this upper, uh, uh, below, uh, upper limit of gastric folds, and it's usually defined as around one centimeter. Some people think it's more. And uh, in cardia, uh, on histology, there are mainly oxyntic glands present. Um, there is a um, some people, when we usually describe during um, uh, endoscopy, that uh, we think are mainly normal, but they, uh, they, we can observe the irregular Z-line. This irregular Z-line, uh, which does not uh, exactly cover with the upper limit of gastric faults, is usually present up to one centimeter above the uh, gay junction. And on histology, um, just be below the Z-line, uh, histopathology can, uh, 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 can describe a mixture of different tissues. These are uh, oxyntic glands and mixed uh, specialized uh, uh, cells and uh, intestinal metaplasia as well. So, uh, for the purpose of the Barrett esophagus, which is the topic strongly linked with this uh, irregular Z-line, um, in people who have the irregular Z-line not extending more than one centimeter, we don't say this is the Barrett esophagus. We should not use the uh, irregular Z-line as Barrett esophagus or mini short or ultra short Barrett esophagus. This is just the irregular Z-line. So in practical terms, when we perform endoscopy and we want to exactly uh, describe this small area, we have to find two anatomical landmarks, if it's possible. So one, is, one is this squamous columnar junction. So this is usually very easily visible between uh, the uh, squamous, uh, squamous um, epithelium is lighter and the columnar epithelium is darker. And we, can, we should find it first. The, the other thing, we have to spend time to exactly know where is the upper limit of gastric faults, which is this gastric So now, now, So now when we look at the, um, the schematic picture, as I said, um, gastroesophageal junction and squamous columnar junction is at the same level in people with normal uh, in normal stomach and we can uh, we could, we should be able to see it during endoscopy um, 
in this context, usually we, knew, we should know um, uh, and we should always think uh, whether we should define, define Barrett if it's present or not. So let me remind you definition of Barrett's esophagus. So it's usually uh, defined as endoscopically recognizable columnar epithelium, which is pink salmon in color, slightly darker, um, within esophagus, which means above the upper limit of gastric folds, okay, that on histology contains col columnar epithelium with specialized intestinal metaplasia. So this is the definition, and in the context of this small area, we should always uh, have the answer. Do we see paratesophagus or not, and do we need to take biopsies or not? And then we usually have the problem uh, when this squamocolumnar junction is not at the same level as, uh, when, as the upper limits of gastric folds. And, um, and then we have to find out whether this irregularity of the Z-line or squamocolumnar junction is uh, more than one centimeter above the uh, level of upper limits of gastric folds. If it's longer than one centimeter, then we should think about Barrett's esophagus, take biopsies, define this as short segment Barrett's esophagus. But if it's uh, less than one centimeter, the current recommendation is that it should not be termed Barrett's esophagus. We do not need to take biopsies, and this is important, and uh, we should just describe as an irregular Z line. I hope it's clear. If anyone does not agree with that, because this is the controversial issue uh, for many years, and people can discuss this, can have, uh, for research purposes, different opinions. Um, but I, I repeat that the current recommendation is that if these irregularities are below one centimeter, we should not call this Barrett's esophagus. This may look like this, uh, when you see just the tongues, uh, uh, and the answer should be whether this is longer than one centimeter or not. This is the example in schema, schema of the obvious Barrett esophagus. When you see in the long distance between upper limit of gastric folds and the um, squamous column injection, this is clearly visible. And if we find it, we can be uh, uh, obviously sure that we have Barrett's esophagus. And on the endoscopy, it's usually like that. And uh, now, question to you. Who thinks that this is Barrett's esophagus? Raise your hands, please. OK. Who think? that it is not Barrett esophagus. Nobody. I agree that having this picture, this schema, we should think about Barrett esophagus. But if I tell you that this schema was taken when there was a lot of air inside and the people were uh, observing this area with over extension, too much air, then it may happen that this is not Barrett esophagus but this is the hiatal hernia. And this is the trick, and this is the reason for many mistakes in this area, that endoscopists uh, do not uh, take care, do not control enough how much air they have in the distal esophagus. They should always try to suck out the air, take out the air, and to see where uh, and then to avoid compressing the gastric folds. And if you do that in patients with hiatal hernia, the gastric folds are in fact at the level of this squamous columnar junction. So this organ's border and the border between the epithelia are covering at the same level, but due to herniation, it looks like on the left side. So this is one of the main mistakes I can. Okay. And this, this is the main uh, reason for, for mistakes. So uh, now the next uh, issue. When to take biopsy in this area and where from? Of course, if you see any abnormalities, like you, uh, you have a suspicion of Barrett's esophagus, 
usually more than one centimeter above the upper limit of gastric folds. If you think that there is, could be a neoplasia or early cancer or something uh, suspicious, you should take always biopsies. If you have a suspicion of discussed today as a phenic esophagitis, of course, yes. Uh, in the distal uh, part of esophagus and uh, also higher up, and with in suspicion of other diseases. However, um, in uh, cases where uh, you do not, you should not take biopsies routinely, are the places where you spend some time in this area and you are sure that the anatomical uh, situation is normal, so you don't need to take uh, biopsies from the normal gastroesophageal junction with the now covering the same level with the squamocolumnar junction. In patients with visible hiatal hernia, there is no need to take biopsies. Also, if there is an irregular Z-line with projections not larger than one centimeter, also, there is no need to take biopsies. If you see these tongues of columnar epithelium but that are shorter than one centimeter, um, this is not recommended to take biopsies. And this is just to, not to make confusion and not to make misdiagnosis with myelitis esophagus. Unless, of course, and this is always allowed for the research purposes, you can take biopsies whenever you want after you have a ethical committee approval and the project is available, so you can do whatever is accepted by the protocol. But for the routine use, don't take biopsies to avoid uh, spending money and to avoid um, uh, confusion in the future. Um, I would also say that uh, there is no need to take biopsies in patients with erosive and non-erosive reflux disease, but I know that there are centers, especially in the United States, where they um, uh, recommend and suggest that in some patients with reflux disease, with the symptoms, also with non-erosive reflux disease, they suggest taking biopsies, so I'm not able, uh, we can leave it for further discussions, but this is controversial. Usually in our center and in many European centers, uh, biopsies are not taken with, in people with uh, reflux disease. There is no need for that. Also, um, we need to answer uh, questions whether in the routine situation uh, do we need a special endoscopic techniques to be sure whether you should take biopsies or not. So the current European recommendations published in endoscopy in 2017 say that routine use of special techniques uh, like chromoendoscopy, optical chromoendoscopy, autofluorescence or other techniques are not recommended for assessment of gastroesophageal junction in the, if in the white light, in the normal, um, normal evaluation, uh, the area looks normal. So there is no need for using this to, to uh, watch it uh, in bed. There is another finding, uh, especially described by Japanese authors uh, in the area um, of gastroesophageal junction. These are the so-called palisade vessels. They are usually in normal situation visible just above the uh, squamocolumnar junction. And in patients with Barrett's esophagus, these vessels stay in the same place, so they can be observed in the area of Barrett's esophagus. So um, Japanese um, doctors um, did some studies uh, asking the question on, uh, whether this is useful or not, um, but the variability of observation but different of service uh, are not um, uh, they say that they are not useful in routine practice. So this, these um, uh, partial vessels, as you see, they are above uh, squamocolumnar junctions, and we should remember that they are in some patients visible, in some patients are not visible, so this cannot be used for routine practice, but we should remember about the existence of these uh, palisade vessels. And the last topic um, to support my view that you don't need to take biopsies in irregular Z-line that is shorter than one centimeter. This is the recent study from 2017 showing the risk of um, high-grade dysplasia and cancer 
in people who have irregular squamous columnar ejections and have no dysplasia there, and the risk there is zero, as you can see on the upper, upper lobe, as compared to Barrett's esophagus risk longer than one centimeter. So this is the confirmation that you don't need to worry about the, uh, uh, the irregular Z line that is shorter uh, in uh, extensions than one centimeter. So another question to you. Um, would you take biopsies with this picture? Who, who wants to take biopsies? This is easy. Uh, who would not take biopsies? One, two, more. Okay, I agree. This is the over, extent, uh, over inflation of the air, as I said, and um, the, taking out the air has shown that there is no barret, there is no, uh, no need to take biopsies, and the gastric folds are better visible, they are coming uh, upper. In this case, would you take biopsies? I can assure that in many endoscopic centers, people would take biopsies, but I would not take. Uh, this is uh, the irregular Z line in the upper and lower part, and this is obviously shorter than one centimeter. It is two, three centimeters. So do not take biopsies. You will make confusion to yourself, and there is extra work for histopathologists. So in conclusion, I would like to say that it is crucial to evaluate carefully gastroesophageal junction area, which is not easy, but you need to spend some time, at least one minute, some people say, if no visible abnormalities, taking biopsies is routinely not recommended. The risk of cancer with irregular squamous column ejection is not really increased, and you don't need to worry about it. But you have to observe this area very carefully. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Yaroslav. And uh, questions and comments, here are, please. But what do you think about the biopsies in case of uh, visible inflamed area in region of cardia? Do you prefer, for example, to give a PPIs for 8 or 12 weeks and after to see again and to decide in that moment about the biopsies? Or do you prefer just immediately? Yeah, in patients with uh, active uh, reflux disease, with visible inflammation, with erosions, as I said, there is no need to take in biopsies. Uh, if uh, usually this this heals easily with uh, proton pump in inhibitors, and there is, you, you, if there is still persists some abnormalities, uh, then you can take biopsies. But in a routine practice, because of so, there are so many patients with the reflux disease, there is no need to take biopsies. Thanks. And I also like to raise the question about the sedation in upper endoscopy and the following uh, the best standards for quality. One minute inspection of cardia is necessity. And uh, if you like to inspect and to use all the other NBIs, etc., et sedation must be probably necessity in majority. Well, this is a good question and difficult. Of course, in the ideal world, with, uh, if we had a lot of money, a lot of time, uh, uh, and people would accept that, the uh, and gastroscopy, even gastroscopy in sedation would be ideal. But uh, for practical reasons, this is not done and it is not possible. Uh, and I must admit that uh, in majority of people who tolerate gastroscopy well, there is uh, really possible to observe uh, this region very well. Of course, in some people who have the uh, vomiting reflexes, um, it is difficult. And then you need to repeat the endoscopy in sedation if you really want to observe uh, the, this junction. I think you, you make a good point because um, in particular in those patients with extensive Barrett segments, so where according to the guidelines you have to take you know, serial biopsies, that can take up quite some time, which for some patients can be very uncomfortable. So I would guess that if a patient shows that at one point in time he or she does not tolerate endoscopy very well, you should either repeat that endoscopy or at least a subsequent endoscopy you should do under sedation to be sure that you have adequate uh, assessment, adequate taking of biopsies. I agree with Professor Bruno, absolutely, because we have a, 
we are witnessing, in fact, a significant increase in prevalence of reflux disease, and uh, in the future, that would be even more. And I think that we are lacking this thinking about the high-quality upper endoscopy. That is the very similar with high-quality colonoscopy. If you like to have high-quality colonoscopy, then you should do very carefully withdrawal seven to eight minutes to see all the details, to observe a serrated lesion, etc. And GA junction is something as a serrated polyps in colon. You should have enough time and to do all the techniques and to take a biopsy in accordance with PRAC criteria and Seattle protocol if you like to be effective. One question uh, to you, Professor Bruno. Do you need anesthesiologist for uh, sedation or are you allowed to do it by yourself, gastroenterologist in the Netherlands? So um, in the Netherlands, the majority of the upper GI endoscopies are still done under what we call conscious sedation, so with midazolam and fentanyl, and that's what we control ourselves, so we don't need anesthesiologist for that. But more and more, we are now doing for advanced endoscopy like ERCP and so forth, we, um, we use propofol sedation, um, and we do have anesthesia nurses for that, who are specialized, trained, and assisted with it. Only when there's intubation, we need an anesthesiologist. Let's move to the next topic. Please, Professor Bruno. Barat Zafagus went to screen surveillance went to in, intervent. Yeah. So um, this subject is close to my heart. I think it's open for a lot of discussion. Um, can I have the... Yeah. Um, so that will be interesting to see what the panel thinks. Um, just some, some, some facts and figures to, to kind of set the stage and to know what we're talking about. It's a relatively common condition um, with, and then I say estimated prevalence of 1 to 2%. This is probably an underestimation because there are many patients do not have complaints with reflux, so never underwent an, an endoscopy, but probably do have Barrett's esophagus. Um, we think and we believe, and I will try to convince you later on, that um, chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease is uh, pivotal and important in this condition. Um, and that it is something to be controlled in order to try to stop progression of Barrett's esophagus. And this is a, important data in my presentation because it tells you something about the risk of uh, Barrett's um, esophagus progressing to esophageal adenocarcinoma because that's what we in fact want to try to avoid happening. And then you see the two um, kind of extremes, that is one is the non dysplastic Barrett's, where the risk of progression to esophageal anocarcinoma is extremely low. It's lower than 0.3%. However, on the other end of the spectrum, we have this high-grade dysplasia, and there we know the risk is very high, more than 5 to 8%. So that's kind of a no-brainer, that later category, that we have to do something about that, that we have to deal with high-grade dysplastic lesions. The problem is with the first category, the non-dysplastic, we now screen them every three to five years, but is that really necessary in these patients? I think that's up for discussion. And with regard to the low-grade dysplasia, we now know that this feature is really a turning point in the history of a patient with Barrett's esophagus, and that is something that we have to look into and have to control and have to treat, or at least have to scrutinize more carefully with follow-up. Um, Abnormal acid exposure seems to be important in Barrett's. There are all kinds of data in the literature there. Um, if you do these ambulatory pH monitoring studies, um, we find uh, more acid exposure in patients with Barrett. Uh, in particular there, it is the issue that these patients have longer period of time where the pH is much lower as compared to only short periods of reflux. It's the duration of the lower pH, that seems to matter. Um, you have mechanical dysfunction, herniation has already been mentioned, people with higher body weight has already been mentioned as risk factors for reflux disease. These are all important and maybe also items that we can look upon where we want to try to control asset reflux. 
Now, the development of Barrett's is a very interesting mechanism in the human body, and in fact, it is not um, sold to the um, esophagus because it happens throughout the body, where uh, some form of epithelium is displaced by another form of epithelium based upon a, a trigger, a chronic injury, in this case, the reflux. Now, there are all kinds of, of theories about the origin of Barrett's metaplasia, so how it comes that the squamous epithelium gets replaced and where the origin of those cells are. I'm not going to, into too much detail now, but it's important because if you do all kinds of therapies where you ablate the mucosa and you try to regenerate squamous epithelium, then there's always this fear and theory that below that renewed epithelium there are still areas of... Um, metaplastic or dysplastic cells that could grow into Barrett's, and that's one of the reasons why we keep continuing to survey these patients even after conversion of the, um, of the Barrett's mucosa. Um, this I always like as, as, an, as, an, as a kind of illustration um, about, one, the GERD symptoms, how important they seem to be, and that has already been recognized uh, very long ago, more than 20 years ago, but also indeed obesity as a trigger to induce reflux disease and as a possible mechanism to try to control that. And that if you combine both of these features, the, the relative risk of these particular individuals to develop during their um, um, Barrett's uh, esophagus uh, habits into a carcinoma is more than 170 uh, times increased. And that's a lot if you talk about relative risk. Now, the early detection and treatment, this is key of my talk, um, because we are talking about uh, a metaplastic tissue that we want to survey to see if there are important changes that need some form of treatment, some form of action. Um, you want to prevent the metaplasia to go into low-grade dysplasia or even high-grade dysplasia. We have means for that. We have, we have drugs to try to control that, but we also have technical endoscopical um, intervention tools to, 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 to intervene. And once you have early cancer or advanced cancer, we all know that that is a big problem and the prospect of these patients to survive in advanced cancer, and advanced and I mean more than T1 type cancer, for patients is relatively low. We have made some progress during the last few years, but um, less than 30% of these patients will survive. So there's a lot to do about preventing this cascade from metaplasia growing into, finally, early cancer. That is important to realize because um, if, you have, if you detect in your follow-up in such a patient high-grade dysplasia or even a small T1M mucosal cancer, then the survival of this patient with endoscopic therapy, endoscopic resection therapy, is excellent. The risk of lymph node metastasis is extremely low, and these patients will survive for more than 96% of cases, which means that we don't need a surgeon in this case. We treat these patients endoscopically in daycare. They get discharged the same day, and they are cured of their cancer. That is completely opposite to more than T1. If you have a T1 SM cancer, then all of a sudden the risk of lymph node metastasis increases to more than 25%, which makes it a disease that you cannot treat endoscopically. You have to do that um, surgically or co combined with, with chemotherapy or radiotherapy, and there the prospect for survival all of a sudden becomes so much uh, lower. So all the reason to concentrate upon trying to find early signs of progression and to treat those patients early before hopefully cancer, but before at least an advanced cancer has developed. So this is this balance between prevention and cure that we have to think about. Um, this is a very difficult scheme. I'm not going to go through it in all detail. You can read it yourself in publications with regard to um, the society instructions with regard to a follow-up of varied patients. But here you find that indeed the low-grade dysplastic uh, lesions that you find on your biopsies make a change with regard to how you follow up these patients. So a non-dysplastic Barrett patients, we only see every three to five years for endoscopy with biopsy taking. But if you find low-grade dysplasia, all of a sudden there's a trigger, there's an alarm sign. Um, in some countries and some centers already, this is reason to convert that epithelium with endoscopic techniques, ablation techniques, 
to get uh, uh, renewed squamous epithelium, and otherwise these patients are kept under close surveillance every year to see if there's progression of low-grade dysplasia into, for example, high-grade dysplasia. Obviously, you, um, you need to have a very good inspection, as was carefully already explained by Professor Regola. And what I would like to urge to you and everybody is to speak the same language, to speak the same language if we, uh, we, we see our different patients, but in particular, if you follow up your patients, so that if you read your reports from year to year to year, you can uh, look at these criteria, which we call the Prague criteria, where we have an, a good uh, description of the um, extent, the maximum and the circumferential extent of the Barrett's esophagus. Um, um, and that has some kind of uh, relation also with the risk of progression, and it also has some relation with the time you have to spend to adequately inspect the mucosa to find um, aberrations, to find visual um, uh, abnormalities. It was already alluded to that um, for a normal esophagus, for an inflamed esophagus, but even for Barrett's esophagus, it doesn't matter that much which type of image modality you use. The important thing is to use your best endoscope available to take time and to have somebody do this who is kind of experienced and also wants to spend the time to carefully inspect the Barrett's segment. It doesn't mean that you do, should not use, for example, MBI or FICE when you have it available because it is helpful. It, it, it gives a kind of a trigger mark. You probably find that abnormality sooner than with the white light endoscopy. But again, studies have shown convincingly that you do not need them per se. But in my unit, we use them because we find it helpful. Now, strategies to prevent the development of adenocarcinoma, um, I already um, explained this, early detection and resection of advanced neoplasia that we find during surveillance. Um, and on the other hand, we would try, we would like to reverse or halt the progression of Barrett's esophagus. And we have some preventive means with drug therapy, in particular proton pump inhibitors. We have NSAID and we have statins. Um, and I would like to go into a little bit more detailed. And of course, endoscopically, we do a lot of um, tissue resections and ablations when patients have areas of high-grade dysplasia or early cancer and to convert the Barrett's into squamous epithelium. Now, there has never been a randomized trial that has shown with grade A scientific proof that we do anything good with um, Barrett surveillance with regard to increasing life expectancy of patients. Although we and others have shown in big cohorts that um, at least um, when you do follow up these patients, then the life expectancy of these patients in these cohort of follow-ups is the same as the general population which at least is a signal that we do something good for the patient, but at the expense of a lot of endoscopies and a lot of invested costs. Now, what I want to quickly uh, allude to is the, um, I already told you the importance of low-grade dysplasia detection. Now, the problem is that if there is one thing that pathologists have a lot of arguments about is the uh, agreement with regard to low-grade dysplasia, let alone that if you take your biopsies wrongly in an inflamed esophagus, then the pathologist is kind of almost blinded because he or she will tell you that there is low-grade dysplasia, while in fact there's not, because if you would have given a protopomp inhibitor, if there would have been no inflammation, you would have not find, found um, low-grade dysplasia. So we've been looking into um, a lot of um, um, uh, studies, and we did our studies ourselves to try to improve this. And what we found is that, in particular, the expression of P53 seems to be a very reliable and very easy to handle marker for a pathologist to help to kind of improve the risk stratification of Barrett's esophagus um, with regard to uh, how to then treat these patients further on with surveillance or ablative therapies. And in particular, if you combine low-grade dysplasia and these P53 um, 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 immune expression, then the relative risk of that patient progressing to um, cancer is relatively high. And you can see in this graph that if you go from non-dysplastic Barrett's up to high-grade uh, high dysplasia or even carcinoma, you see an increased um, uh, issue of P53 overexpression. 
which is at least in our view and our um, um, situation, local clinic, very helpful in dealing with these patients. And I think it's important because of this huge cohort that we follow of more than 800 people, of these 770 people that had both this P53 expression and concurrent low-grade dysplasia, uh, about a third developed uh, a um, carcinoma in less than five years follow-up. So that gives you kind of a tool to improve risk stratification of these patients and to, uh, uh, to have attention with regard to a better surveillance or even treat these patients very early on with regard to reversal of the um, squamous epithelium. So in summary and conclusion, only a very small fraction of people with Barrett's truly run the risk of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma. So we do a lot uh, of screening and interventions for not so much with regard to prevent preventing esophageal adenocarcinoma to occur. It's all about putting the, um, uh, and directing the right amount of efforts and money to the right persons at risk. And I think we're not there yet. We have to improve this as a community. Use your best scope available, take your time. Absolute measures of control of reflux should be taken. Later on, we will have a discussion and we'll, I will come up with a little bit more evidence to support that. Um, if, if you have to remember anything of my talk, remember that this low-grade dysplasia, that is kind of a tipping point with regard to the risk of a patient. And there you really have to be attentive what to do next and at least survey that, survey that patient with uh, smaller intervals of one year. Um, and I already told you, um, dysplastic lesions and everything below T1 uh, SM should be removed with endoscopic means. Um, and then the remainder of the Barrett ablated. And then you have reversed the risk for that patient. And the risk of that patient seems to be, again, normal population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. The questions? And comments. So, um, what it does mean that, uh, uh, let's put it in the Netherlands, let me put it in the Netherlands because I know those numbers. In the Netherlands, more than 40% of the people report reflux every month. Of all these people that we scope because of reflux, less than 1% in the Netherlands have Barrett's esophagus. Of those patients with Barrett's esophagus, in the end, less than 1% and even lower will get adenocarcinoma. So it's low, 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 low. So we, do, we spend an awful lot of money and endoscopy and resources to prevent a small number of esophageal cancers. And that's important. It's really, really important. But I do believe we have to find better ways to uh, direct our resources and we should scope less people uh, with low risk and we have to do more in patients with high risk. Uh, two questions, in fact. Uh, what about uh, birth patients without reflux symptoms? Yeah. And second question, when you surveil those patients, do you always uh, biopsy according to Seattle protocol, or do you just carefully scope them and take okay. the time to see the, uh, the surface mucosa, I mean the, the pattern and the vascular pattern? So the first question with regard to um, the, pay, the people with Barrett's who do, do not have reflux disease. Well, first of all, probably there are all sitting also people here who have Barrett's, but they don't have any complaints, so they have never had an endoscope, so you don't know. Secondly, if you for whatever reason, scope a patient and you find Barrett's and that patient doesn't have any clinical symptoms, first of all, it doesn't mean that there is no acid reflux because people respond with complaints very differently to the same amount of reflux. And secondly, that patient has to go into surveillance with you know, the same precautions as a patient with uh, acid reflux. Now, an important question in this regard is whether you should, you should give that patient PPIs. Because if you don't have complaints and you prescribe a patient medication, the chance that that patient will adhere to the medication is not so big. So there we do pH manometry. And if we prove that there's acid reflux, then we discuss this with the patient and we try to convince the patient of the importance 
of taking medication. Um, and the second question I forgot. Uh, the biopsies. Oh yeah, the biopsies. Uh, yeah, always. absolutely, because um, you know that's the only thing we know so far that is helpful in finding areas of low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia that we missed during careful inspection. So it's not off-off, it's end-end. You have to carefully inspect, and after careful inspection, you first take biopsies from visual, visual abnormal areas, and then you take your quadrant biopsies. Now, to give you one example, because we just finished a manuscript and we just submitted it, we had a worldwide um, analysis, meta-analysis, about how we adhere to these standards. So your question of taking these quadrant biopsies, and it's, and it's abysmal, less than 50% of the people adhere to what we already agreed upon, I think 20 years ago or something. So it shows, and it was also what you alluded to, we are not very good as a community and as individual doctors to adhere to what we jointly agree upon, what is best for patients. So we should do better in that regard. And I'd like to ask you about PPI long-term therapy uh, in sense of uh, diminishing symptoms you said and you evidently showed us that 44 times higher risk is in persistent symptoms. Do you prefer on-demand therapy for reflux or long-term PPI in any sense? Well, it depends on your wording and the, and the, and the diagnosis. So if it's, if it's a patient with reflux disease and the patient does not have Barrett's, I think on-demand therapy is fine and probably the way you should do it and, and acceptable for the patient. But if you have Barrett's esophagus, it's something very different. And as I explained, and I will later on again show you some slides, that in particular the continuous exposure to acid is the issue, not so much the pulsatile exposure. So their chronic inhibition of acid reflux is pivotal. Uh, we have to move to, uh, to clinical presentation. Uh, Professor Shishin, Kirill Vyacheslavich. Dear Professor Shishin, please proceed with your clinical case. Before, uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to present our data. And uh, personally, I would like to thank Professor Regula and Professor Bruno for their contribution to concise description of this problem. And I would like to pre present you our clinical case, a patient with a long segment of uh, Barrett, Barrett's esophagus. Uh, imagine. Uh -huh. I have some problems with my slides. Our patient uh, is uh, quite interesting, uh, a patient of 54 who suffered for, uh, from GERD uh, symptoms for a long time. And uh, Nissen fund application was performed uh, in 2017. Later on, the symptoms of a reflux resumed and um, uh, he was diagnosed with a distal uh, migration of the epithelium, which was related to the clinical picture and the reflux uh, recurrence. On biopsy, uh, a long um, segment of Barrett's esophagus was diagnosed with severe histological changes. On biopsy, high-grade dysplasia was diagnosed as well. Uh, therefore, he had clear high-grade dysplasia, however, with, uh, without clear focal lesions. And uh, this patient was very interesting uh, for us because we had to treat him as a high-risk patient uh, for oncological uh, process. The problem of identification of um, gastroesophageal Junction in patients who underwent uh, a Nissen fund application is quite actual. This is what Professor Regula was mentioning in his uh, talk, because uh, the change is already there, and we have to thoroughly stage the patient. And uh, during the follow-up, we need to evaluate the signs of regression and uh, 
uh, columnar and squamous uh, epithelial junction has to be evaluated uh, thoroughly, uh, both at uh, the level of gastroesophageal junction and also the level of metaplasia should be uh, evaluated. Here we should uh, uh, rely on the uh, criteria of smoothening of uh, gastric uh, f folders, folds, and uh, and uh, uh, to prevent the condition of over bloating air, over excessive air in the gastro. On endoscopy, we could clearly see the focal changes of the gastro and the esophagus but uh, there were no signs of, uh, suspicious for early uh, cancer. Most of the current uh, treatment methods imply a two-stage approach. Uh, when we see uh, typical changes of, of Barrett's esophagus should be destroyed uh, uh, using uh, endoscopic methods uh, in the areas of uh, dysplasia. There were no visual changes in the uh, esophagus uh, or in the gaster and the metaplasia was uh, quite diffuse of a mixed type, both in the esophagus and in uh, the gaster. Uh, depending on the chosen method of uh, destruction, uh, you can go for radiofrequency ablation. The lumen of the esophagus is uh, different at uh, different levels, and uh, in patients with uh, Barrett's uh, uh, esophagus, argon coagulation uh, would, uh, th this operation would uh, require a longer time. And this is a very complicated method per se, because we decided to go for radiofrequency ablation. Uh, we used a special catheters of Barks Express that uh, combine measuring balloon as well as a special radio frequency ablation balloon. At different levels of the esophagus, esophagus we see different diameter of the lumen, and this uh, catheter can uh, adjust uh, the ablation uh, process at, at different levels of the esophagus, adapting itself to it, its internal diameter. The procedure is technically very simple. It is done under visual control. There is a standard approach uh, to radio frequency ablation using circular sensor. The procedure implies RFA uh, session with a, a subsequent destruction of the lesion at uh, the extent of the... Uh, Here we process. see the first uh, step of the radio frequency ablation. This is a device that does everything. It measures the diameter of the esophagus. It uh, supports, uh, it chooses the uh, optimal position of the cuff and uh, makes a radio frequency ablation. The catheter uh, has uh, four centimeters length uh, for the ablation part, uh, and for one seance, one session, uh, we uh, subject uh, the segment of uh, uh, four centimeters uh, to the test uh, and out of uh, so radio frequency ablation is the most delicate uh, type uh, of uh, uh, intervention that is uh, uh, accompanied by the minimal uh, risk uh, of potential development of uh, scar uh, structures. Uh, those patients that have already this cuff, uh, it is uh, difficult uh, to uh, use uh, uh, this ablation in the part of the uh, gastroesophageal uh, junction. Uh, so it is uh, uh, in the compressed uh, state. Uh, that's why, uh, speaking about the choice of the method of ablation, the priority is to be given to radio frequency ablation. And and uh, choosing between different variants within the radio frequency ablation we may choose this Barks Express uh, cuff uh, that measures uh, the uh, pressure and the uh, diameter uh, of the uh, esophagus uh, so 
So, uh, so for the uh, the second uh, session uh, must have an effect on the uh, purified uh, tissues because we are uh, fighting the uh, one cell epithelium. That's why the depth uh, is very superficial, and we need to prepare the mucus for the next session. The next, uh, the second session of uh, uh, R. FA uh, has a hemostatic uh, effect after the mechanical effect of cleaning. Uh, technically, the procedure is uh, simple, but we need uh, to observe or uh, to comply with the rules. Uh, we start with the proximal part and the visual control. <coughs> After the first session, we uh, see there is uh, some yellowish, brownish uh, uh, coloring of uh, the surface subjected to ablation. That means uh, that we have reached uh, the uh, muscular uh, plane of the mucus. Uh, and uh, uh, that means that we have uh, reached the point, the thickness that we need. Uh, the further sessions of RFA uh, start with uh, a small overlap uh, lap of the first uh, zone uh, of uh, exposure in order to process the proximal level in the optimal way of metaplasic uh, epithelium. And technically, it is no different uh, from the first session. The process is fully mechanized. We get all the information about the diameter of the esophagus, about the uh, percent of energy uh, delivered to the tissue in percentage. And visually, we can control the effect of our uh, intervention. This is a. Uh, 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 rather expensive, uh, but uh, very indicative, uh, uh, advisable method uh, for the Barrett esophagus. Uh, we deal with the high-grade displeasure. We shouldn't uh, forget uh, that this uh, patient is uh, uh, under the risk of cancer development. So uh, as a fragile adenocarcinoma, if he is not treated, it is 100% that it will develop in this patient. So in order to speed up, I wouldn't show uh, this process to the end. But the important conclusion is uh, that uh, the uh, circular uh, sensors and radio frequency ablation are the best uh, choice for therapy in this case if we have a long segment uh, uh, Barrett esophagus. The uh, next conclusion is uh, if we have a patient with BE, first it should be referred to endoscopic treatment, uh, and then uh, we can make anti-reflux intervention if the person has a hernia and uh, uh, reflux symptoms. Uh, because the uh, previous uh, changes uh, that appear due to surgery uh, complicate the endoscopic work. Uh, RFA is, is uh, the method of choice uh, when we have a high-grade displeasure without any visible lesions. And the use of such a uh, catheter uh, is an adequate method uh, for uh, making RFA in this situation. Thank you for your attention. I think uh, that... Uh, Thank you very much uh, for the presentation of the clinical case. And uh, if we have a patient with BE uh, and uh, reflux, uh, reflux signs, many surgeons believe that fund duplication uh, is good, but that uh, um, uh, makes the endoscopic management of the patient more difficult. Everyone will agree 
that uh, anti-reflux uh, surgery, if it is used after the endoscopic uh, treatment uh, has been uh, made. Uh, any other questions on the clinical case? Yaroslav, no. No. About the differences between countries in how to deal with this patient, because, for example, in the Netherlands, anti-reflux surgery is extremely rare, extremely rare, and it's, it's in fact difficult for me to find a surgeon who would be willing in a, in a patient to do that. So only if you know the patient is on high dose PPIs and we have multiple pH manometries, then I might be able to, to convince them. But I think we have the experience that with the proper medical therapy, we are mostly able to control reflux. I absolutely agree with this comment that in the present time, therapy is... I quite agree that conservative therapy is not inferior to surgical treatment, surgical treatment of BE. Sometimes, really, the number of these operations is reducing, especially in expert centers. But in non-expert centers, you know, sometimes patients are under-examined, under and uh, uh, they uh, are subjected to surgery. And probably uh, that uh, um, Mr. Sheshan had uh, the case when the operation was made, and then it was difficult to endoscopically treat BE. Uh, thank you very much for this session. Uh, now we'll have a coffee break. And uh, let us uh, come back here in 10 minutes. Let us try to meet here in 10 minutes and continue our meeting.